everybody, how's it going? Today, let's take a detailed look at the 1993 Dodge Viper RT-10. And this is going to be a detailed, in-depth look at the Viper. We'll start it up, show the engine, get an exhaust clipping over the performance data, as well as show you a bunch of the unique aspects of the interior, as well as exterior. And before we begin, I'd like to extend a big thanks and shout out to Foreign Cars Italia, located in Charlotte, North Carolina, for allowing me to come out and film the very rare 1993 Dodge Viper RT-10. And so, without further ado, let's get started her up, let her run. The first generation Vipers were extremely basic vehicles. They didn't have any door handles on the exterior, or side glass, or even a fixed roof. This canvas top with plastic openings was the easiest way to get inside. Basically zippers shut, you reach your hand in and grab the interior door handle. The exterior color is known as Viper Red, featuring a gray vinyl interior. The Viper comes standard with power-assisted rack and pinion steering fed through a three-spoke steering wheel that's wrapped in leather with heavier bolsters up top. As far as the gearbox, the standard and only transmission available was an all-new Borg Warner T56 six-speed manual transmission paired with a hydraulically actuated 12-inch clutch. It's all fed through an aluminum drive shaft to a limited slip 3.07 to 1 Dana 44 differential. It does feel smooth and precise, but I wouldn't necessarily call it a close ratio. Fed through a leather wrapped knob, complementing a leather wrapped e brake. And so we're going to flip on the headlamps, as well as hazards. Then we're going to check out the exterior, shall we? The Dodge Viper concept was originally introduced at the 1989 North American International Auto Show as an all-new sports car by Chrysler Corporation. The idea began as an attempt to create a modern-day Cobra. What they ended up creating was a sports car legend, a car that would show the public that Dodge wasn't just a mass producer of K-cars, but a brand that still retained that spice of life. The passion of building dedicated performance machines that made history in the 1960s. When the concept was unveiled, it took everyone by surprise. The fact that this exotic supercar came from the same company who built the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Reliant. As you would expect, the hype and buzz was astounding, followed by a wave of requests for production. At this time, the green light was given for Viper production, with the subsequent formation of Team Viper. Team Viper was a group of 85 engineers that volunteered and began developing the prototypes in March of 1989 and had a running full-bodied example by the end of the year. While the first pre-production prototype utilized a V8, a custom-designed 8-liter V10 was on its way through collaboration between Dodge and Lamborghini, which at the time was a subsidiary of Chrysler Corporation. This team platform strategy was a new concept for domestic manufacturers and widely used by the ever-popular Japanese marks. By creating a network of suppliers, 
Ideal for low volume production, it would speed up the production process and save the cost of building all new facilities for a car not expected to carry high profit margins. The team process would lead to a very rapid turnaround from concept to production. What Viper represented was the brand's new Halo car, bringing excitement and design cues, not to mention technology and build strategy to the rest of the lineup over the years. The first generation Viper was ready to hit the streets in January of 1992, just three short years after its concept debut. Compared to other high-end sports cars of the day, the Viper was a rather crude, unsophisticated vehicle overall. Keeping production costs and weight savings a priority, the Viper was very minimalistic in its design both inside and out. This was a car that threw caution to the wind, designed from the ground up around its engine with everything else taking a back seat. This wasn't necessarily a bad thing though. While Viper may have lacked sophistication, technology, and Italian design, it also had a personality all its own. It didn't look or drive like anything else in the market and therefore it was hard to compare. While it had always been compared and pitted against the Corvette, it's just a different car, not built to be like a Corvette, but built to be a Viper. The production RT-10 was strikingly similar to the swoops and curves of the original concept, but while it looked very aerodynamic, in reality it was kind of the opposite, with a reported coefficient of drag of .49 with the soft top removed. The Viper's custom designed V-10 would share almost nothing with its truck counterpart. The engine was based on Chrysler's LA design commonly used in trucks and essentially based on the current 360 V8 with a couple cylinders tacked on. Common sense would say that to use a truck engine in a light sports car would be detrimental in performance and weight. Therefore, it required heavy modifications to turn it into a real performer. For one, the new engine would be cast entirely out of aluminum by Lamborghini, saving around 150 pounds over the cast iron truck block, a total weight of 711 pounds for the engine. Due to cost, a two valve per cylinder pushrod design was maintained while the rest received a thorough makeover. It featured dual throttle bodies with a low profile cross ram intake up front. It has a higher compression ratio, strengthened rods and crankshaft, enlarged valves, lighter pistons, and a higher max RPM. Not to mention the manifolds, oil pan, heads, and accessory drive were unique to the Viper. To help in cooling, Lamborghini also adapted an F1 inspired external coolant manifold that runs alongside the block resulting in the lowest temperature rise of any Chrysler engine produced before it. The valve covers are also magnesium with cast steel tuned exhaust headers. The chassis is composed of two large rectangular tube frame rails that was then attached to a central tubular backbone. The tubular rear chassis provided the suspension mounting points as well as the cradle for the fuel tank, battery, and spare tire. It was positioned as such to help add extra weight to the rear wheels for better traction and gives the car a perfect weight distribution. We'll talk more about the suspension in just a bit, but it's largely made of the tubular steel components, aside from the front and lower control arms which were actually adapted from the Dodge Dakota, just as the power steering was. It just so happens that the dimensions they needed were perfect for the Viper's application. The body consists of resin transfer molded and sheet molded composite lower panels, whereas functional hood and side fender heat extractors help remove heat quickly. All in all, the car is over 3 inches wider than a Corvette, while it's lower than a Ferrari F40 and over 2 inches lower than an Acura MSX. Of course, the standard menacing side pipes prevent a signature 60s flavor, but watch your legs climbing out the vehicle though, those rocker panels get hot. The Viper featured standard 3-spoke silver painted forged aluminum alloy wheels, not only on the larger side but they're also quite wide. 17 by 10 inches in front and 17 by 13 inches in the rear. Wrapped in high performance Michelin Pilot Sport tires, 275-40s in front and 355-35s in the rear. Engineered to pull an impressive 1G in lateral cornering forces. As far as the brakes, the Viper also features larger ventilated disc brakes to help cope with the high demands. Up front you have 13 by 1.26 inch discs with 4 piston fixed calipers, while the rear also has 13 inch discs but they're thinner at .87 inches wide and have a single piston sliding caliper. While the brakes were powered, they didn't come with any analog braking systems nor did it have any sort of stability or traction control. It was truly a raw vehicle letting the driver be fully in control. It was able to accelerate from 0 to 100 miles an hour and back down to 0 in less than 15 seconds, a similar engineering technique they used with the original Shelby Cobra. The suspension features double wishbones at all four corners with unequal length control arms as well as coil springs and gas filled shock absorbers. 
Overall length is 175.1 inches with a wheelbase of 96.2 inches. Total width is 75.7 inches and height is 44 inches. Weight is just under 3,300 pounds. In order to pop the hood, the latch release is located within the grill here. Now you have the front portion open and from there just lift up. We've talked a lot about the engine so far so let's recap and highlight performance. The original Viper sports an all aluminum overhead valve 90 degree 8 liter V10 with sequential multi-port fuel injection. It displaces 488 cubic inches, has two valves per cylinder, a compression ratio of 9.1 to 1, and a red line of 6,000 RPM. At the time, it was the largest engine Chrysler had produced. Total horsepower output is 400 at 4,600 RPM, and an impressive 465 pound-feet of torque at 3,600 RPM. Even more impressive was its wide power band, with as much as 400 pound-feet of torque available as low as 1,200 RPM. That translates to 0 to 60 times as low as 4.6 seconds, with quarter mile times of 12.9 seconds at 113.8 miles an hour. Top speed is around 165 miles an hour. As far as fuel economy, with a 19 gallon tank and required premium unleaded, the EPA rated the Viper between 12 miles to a gallon city and 20 on the highway. Like I showed you earlier, the first gen Vipers lack exterior door handles or roll up windows. Primarily designed as an open top roadster, the canvas top and plastic windows are your protection from the elements if needed. Otherwise it all removes and stores neatly into the trunk. The minimalistic layout is seen throughout the interior, designed only for people who want a great driving car and nothing more. Creature comforts, soft touch padding and even air conditioning in early models was not available. The seatbelts mounted on the door are really your only safety net as there's obviously no airbags. The seating though is surprisingly comfortable with deep bolsters and reasonable padding. While it doesn't adjust for height, it does manually adjust fore and aft in addition to recline. There's even inflatable lumbar for both seats, with a pump located in front of the seat and actually looks like it was taken from a blood pressure cuff. Climbing in doesn't take as much effort as you would think, but you also want to watch out for the hot rocker panels. The pedals are offset to the left with no room for a dead pedal. This is due to the packaging of the front midship engine layout as well as the headers. Another unique tidbit is the silvery material across the dash and the doors. It's not just painted trim but rather structural urethane foam trim, the first time used on a domestic car. So let's go and see if she sounds. Like I said, the interiors for these Vipers are pretty spartan. Plastic galore, basically just designed to be a track car with good handling as well as good performance. Not necessarily creature comforts. Across the dash, as well as center console, is metallic silver highlighted trim, blending into the gray and black two-tone door panels. Your accessory gauges for vehicle diagnostics are located up top, including your vehicle temperature, oil pressure, vehicle fuel, and voltometer to the far right. Your three rectangular air vents in the middle and simple climate control adjustments located down below here. 
Now, while it does give the indication it does have AC in this model, this one, in fact, does not. Many of the first generation Vipers actually didn't. I think it wasn't until 94 or 95 that they actually started putting air conditioning in these cars. And down below that is a very simple AM FM radio with in dash cassette deck. Your fog lamp switch, like I showed you earlier, lighter, as well as a little ashtray. No cup holders, just a flat center console trailing into the rear speakers, slender rear window. It's just such a cool looking vehicle. The visors are indeed padded. And the rear view mirror is manually dimming, but it does have reading lamps down below. Not to mention a very simple speedometer cluster with your speedometer off to the far left, tachometer inset to the far right, and all of your warning lamps located in the middle. Alrighty. So we're gonna shut her down. And then push down on the release switch to take the key out. So, let's go and check out the rest of the vehicle, shall we? Opening up the trunk is also a two-step process. It can only be unlocked by using the key. Once open, you lift it up and notice there are no gas-charged struts to help hold it up. Instead, there's a metal prop similar to what you would find holding up a car's hood. Once in place, you're free to load up around 6.8 cubic feet worth of cargo. Taking into consideration the spare tire and top storage, that's likely to decrease to just a few bags worth. The passenger seat is also manually sliding. And you also have a glove box. The Viper is a pure expression of emotion. You either love it or hate it. It's a brutal, purest driving machine without any electronic safety features or airbags. With a massive V10, rear wheel drive, and a manual transmission, it's without a doubt one of a kind. While compared to many, it's similar to a few. After all, it's a Viper. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed the in-depth look at the 1993 Dodge Viper RT10. Be sure to stay tuned next time, there's a lot more where that came from. Take care everybody.